Well, good evening, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is Rattlecast number 44. It is Monday, June 8th. Thanks so much for joining us on this special day. Uh, we have Dorian Lux here, one of my all-time favorite poets, um, and it's just a pleasure to have her in just a little bit. Um, let me make sure that all the streams and everything are working before we start, because they didn't one time. But, um, yeah, here we go. Hello, everybody. Um, now, I should say before we start, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in publication since 1995, and uh, two years after that, we interviewed Dorian Lux for issue number eight. Um, uh, but our mission is to promote the practice of poetry. And uh, if you enjoy that mission and you like these broadcasts every, every Tuesday night usually, uh, please do click the like button and share and tell your friends to subscribe because... Um, that's all we ask for is that um, we spread this poetry around the world, and uh, that's what we do every Tuesday night. Usually, uh, we also have uh, workshops online on video every Friday afternoon. We have poetry spun live every Sunday. So if you like those, please do subscribe. Make sure you're following our Facebook page if that's where you're watching it, and uh, click the like button because that's how you tell the computer overlords that you care, which means other people might care, which means that uh, these videos will spread around and people will share more poetry, which is what we need in this world more than ever, I think. Uh, hey, Jessica Dawson and Kathy Gibbons, good to see you. Um, and um, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, there's a chat window, and you can leave a comment there if you want me to pass any questions along to Dorian as the uh, evening progresses. Now, for, for the warm-up poem, as everybody starts to wander in, and gather around the old screen. Um, I thought we'd just read today's poem, which I loved. Um, this is one of my favorite poems from the spring issue. It's one of those ones that might be a Pushcart Prize nominee, maybe. I mean, it depends what we, we publish for the rest of the year, but this is one of the ones that's in the running. Uh, and this is uh, William Evans' poem, uh, Social Experiment in Which I Am the Bear. At the dinner party, I didn't want to attend because these people are from work, meaning overtime without pay. And one woman, newish person and old money, ring on her hand that could lift a family out of the mud, says, Boy, I didn't know you were this funny. I didn't know you were a troubadour, a silk rousting my ears. And of course I am paraphrasing, because she can't really talk like me, a writer and all, except when she flexes and says, And I heard you write poetry too, my worship you aren't intimidating at all, are you? You're as ursine as they come. And if you think she didn't really say ursine, then you've never seen a hunter try to aim straight with one hand while they offer the forest gifts with the other. And if you think I didn't know she thought I was once a great beast neutered down to civility, then you haven't attended enough dinner parties. And I wish I had relevant facts about bears. How we are of the few animals that can see in color. How we can be vegetarians or carnivores. How even a shaved polar bear is still black, but this time I just laugh low and hollow like a stolen growl. I am already on my hind legs after all, already talking with my paws wide as a preservation. My voice shakes the leaves even when I don't plan on it. Our lineage traces back generations, but once you've assimilated, it's hard to tell when you were captured. Who's to argue where the bear ends and the circus begins? There's a world between learning the song of one's claws against a new throat and performing tricks for anyone who bought a ticket. But I did wash the mud from my fingernails before I arrived. I'm still laughing, by the way, still hoarding my teeth deeper within me. I am a library full of times I yanked something apart and the times I went hungry and the times I let my hair grow and grow and grow until I was a snarl of a thing and I ate everything the party could offer me like I could never become full. That was William Evans, his poem, um, um, Social Experiment in Which I Am the Bear. And um, William Evans is, um, oops, hang on a second. You can find him at William the Third. That is uh, William the Three RD.com. Uh, so here's his website right here, William Evans. So check that out if you would. That was our warm up poem for the day. That was also today's daily poem at rattle.com. So, um, if you aren't subscribed to our daily poem, you get a poem like that in your in email inbox every single day. So do enjoy that. Now, um, today's guest, like I mentioned, is Dorian Lux. And um, Dorian's always been one of my favorite poets. In fact, she, um, 
I might not even be here today if it wasn't for Dorian. And um, she was one of the books that I fell in love with um, as, a, as a molecular biology major at the University of Rochester, not thinking I'd ever be interested in poetry at all. Um, her sixth collection, Only As the Day Is Long, New and Selected Poems, was named a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Her fifth collection, The Book of Men, was awarded the Patterson Prize. Her fourth book of poems, Facts About the Moon, won the Oregon Book Award and was shortlisted for the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. She's also the, also the author of Awake, What We Carry, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Smoke, as well as a fine small press edition of The Book of Women. Uh, she's the co-author of the celebrated text, The Poet's Companion, A Guide to the Pleasures of Writing Poetry. And you can find more of her at uh, DorianLux.com. That's D-O-R-I-A-N-N-E-L-A-U-X.net. DorianLux.net. I think I said .com. It's .net. Um, but here she is, Dorian Lux. Hello, Dorian. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um and it is, you're really one of the first, maybe the first poet that I fell in love with around 2000 when I was at the U of R. I was taking a class with James Longenbach as an elective. Oh, yeah. And um, and I think he, we taught your, he taught your book in the class. And it was one of the things that I fell in love with. Um, so it's so great to finally meet you after all these years. We published you a few yeah. times and um, it's just great to meet you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You know, also, I think I did one of the first uh, interviews. Yeah, and yeah. I was, so let me show that on screen for everybody. This was um, issue number eight, and, and Dorian can't see it here, but only everybody watching at home can. But um, this was issue number eight of Rattle, now completely out of print. And, and honestly, maybe it's a good idea that's out of print because there's a lot of typos. <laughs> but it was uh, two years into Rattle's history, and uh, Dorian was the interview there. And um, just, we had great foresight, I think, to... Um, to know that we were interviewing a special poet when it was Dorian Lux. So, um, yeah, yeah it, it, I'd say you can check that out, but you can't. You can't get a copy. And actually, even my copy is a, um, you see this little line, if anybody can see yeah. it. It's one of these um, return copies from a bookstore, so we can't even resell oh, yeah. them, a remaindered or whatever they call it. I don't even have right. a fresh copy that I could sell. But um, So, Dorian, do you want to start out with a poem from, uh, your, from your new book or, or anything you want? Yeah, yeah, a poem from my new book. Why not? Um, these are all old poems from my new book. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought I would start with this poem called Late October, just because I like it. Oh, and what, what uh, page is it on? Let me know so I can... It's page 27. Thank you. And uh, I wrote it as a little um, Halloween gift for my editor, who was Al Poulin oh. at Boa Editions, which was based, I guess still based, in Rochester, New York. And um, he would call me up 2 o'clock in the, his time, 2 o'clock in the morning, and because uh, he'd be up and he'd say, hey, have you written anything? Or, you know, read me a poem. I mean, he was just fabulous. And, uh, and so I wanted to make him a little gift, so I, I made him this little card with the witch on it and, and wrote this poem for him. And at that time, I was uh, getting ready to publish What We Carry. And uh, he said, uh, when he got the poem in the mail, he said, this is going to be the first poem in What We Carry. <laughs> oh, wow. You have to have the poem in the book. And so it got in there right under the line, you know, sometime in late October. Midnight. The cats under the open window, their guttural, territorial yowls. Crouched in the neighbor's driveway with a broom, I jab at them with the bristle end, chasing their raised tails as they scramble from bush to bush, intent on killing each other. I shout and kick until they finally give it up. One shimmies beneath the fence, the other under a car. I stand in my underwear in the trembling quiet, remembering my dream. Something had been stolen from me, valueless and irreplaceable. Grease and grass blades were stuck to the bottoms of my feet. I was shaking and sweating. I had wanted to kill them. The moon was a white dinner plate, broken exactly in half. I saw myself as I was. 41 years old, standing on a slab 
of cold concrete, a broom handle slipping from my hands, my breasts bare, my hair on end, afraid of what I might do next. And that was awesome. That was late October. Late October. Yeah, from Only As The Day Is Long. Um, and I have to mention, because um, it's just so strange, we do a prompt after every, after every uh, episode for next week so people can have something to write about. And um, it's so bizarre that, like, the world is a simulation or something. Or there's some weird thing going on because it always relates somehow to something. And today's prompt is going to be write about your last dream. So to oh, lead off with that perfect. poem um, is kind of perfect. perfect. But one of the things I noticed reading through, um, this is a new and selected an- anthology, is that you, um, you know, I've read, you know, every, everybody's read a lot of new and selected poems, and they're usually laid out chronologically. And one thing that really stands out is that your voice was like the same voice at the very beginning, like you already had your voice. Um, and, and the poems are just, there's such a consistency. Like if, if it wasn't a new and selected and you said like, these are just all poems, it, would, it wouldn't feel like disorienting at all. It would feel like it was all the same sort of soul sharing these poems to me. Um, mm. Can you talk a little bit about like how your first book came to be and, and how you ended up sort of finding your voice? Well, this, this poem that I just read was from my second book, mm-hmm. What We Care. I was 41. When my first book came out, it was 2000, so I was four years younger than 41. And that's actually very late to publish a first book. And I had been writing about 13, 14 years before Awake was ever published. And so, and, and, I, and it was before, you know, the MFA programs had really caught, I mean, there was maybe Iowa and, you know, a few am a handful of that. And so I never went to an MFA. Oh, uh-oh. Writing for myself, I had no concept that other people were out there. Hmm. Uh, Dorian, we're starting to... Yeah, we lost the connection for a second. Your call dropped. Sorry, everybody. She froze for a second, so I knew it was coming. Um, let me hang up, um, and call her back. Hey, Dorian, so sorry about that. Let me see. Um, yeah, yeah so just the, me. The, it, well, no, it was just the internet connection. Okay. Although you have to put, push your video button again, I think, so we can see you. There, here you come. Yeah. Okay, you're back. Yeah, that just happens. I think what happens is that, um... You're Around this night? time of night, people start like watching Netflix in your neighborhood or in your wherever you are, and and it'll it'll yeah. slow down a little bit. But uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for the for the audio version for the podcast, we can just cut that out. Um, right. But you were saying um, that when we when you dropped that um, you you hadn't been to an MFA program because yeah that... yeah. So I was really writing in 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 uh, solitary confinement here and. Uh, and eventually I, I became familiar with the contemporary American poets, most especially who I loved was Sharon Olds and Carolyn Porche. But Pablo Neruda really excited me too. Steve introduced us to the world poets, which was really wonderful. And so I kind of developed my own voice. I was also older. And so I already had a voice. I mean, I was a waitress. I was a mother. I was a, you know, I mean, I, I lived a life and I knew what I thought and felt and, and, uh, what interested me. And so I wasn't sort of influenced much by my peers, like you would be in an MFA program. And I was older. So the way I spoke was the way I spoke. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I can see my MFA students beginning to develop And their voices become more mature over time, which is a wonderful thing to see. But I also love their raw, you know, um, young voices, too, because they're filled with so much passion. And and um, but, you know, so I think that's probably one of the reasons I I didn't I was already mature. (laughs) (laughs) My voice didn't have to mature much, but hopefully you know, hopefully I've gained something over this time of reading and writing so much, which I hope is more reflected in my craft and the subjects that I choose. Mm-hmm. 
know, to write about. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. The voice remains the same. Can you tell me what poem it was that you read, or you read the whole book? Or the, yeah, read I read it? through the whole book, and oh. um, yeah, and it was just really cool. I thought that um, you know, I mean, the the poems are just. I, I just love your work. So, um, so you know, so, I mean, some poets start, start to experiment and, and go into really different directions with style and stuff. And I'm, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's like a selfish sort of response. <laughs> but my response is, oh, these, this is still Dorian the whole time. And, and the newer poems were just amazing. I, I mean, I had tears in my eyes for a whole bunch of them about your mother's death and um, just a, it's a wonderful collection. And um, so, so, yeah, I just love that aspect of it, that, that there's like a, a Dorian poem, and, um, and 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 you never let me down. <laughs> um, do you want to read a couple more, maybe to to keep going? Yeah, no, my that? mother has always been my muse from the very beginning. I mean, I I was just uh, amazed by her. You know, she was beautiful. She was tall. She was stately. She was um, she had dark raven hair that was wavy and. And uh, whereas all us kids were pretty much toe-headed and kind of bland looking, my mom looked like a movie star. She looked like Katherine Hepburn. And <clears throat> so, and she, you know, one of the things that I thought was wonderful about her was that I got to see her uh, mature in a lot of ways, especially when she went back to school when all of us were young and became a nurse, which was amazing to me, you know, I mean, she already played the piano, she spoke three languages, she, you know, and we lived in Navy housing in San Diego, California, she was an unusual person in our, on our block, and we were actually made fun of quite a bit, because, you know, it was like my mom was not like the other moms, and, um, you know, you know, Beethoven would come pounding through our front door and our windows, you know, as she played the piano. And then she was off at school and studying late at night. And, you know, she just was an unusual creature. And uh, so I've always admired uh, her, uh, her, her nursing. And, um, you know, she, she, uh, she was such a nurse that none of us really got much of her expertise, you know, I mean, it was just like, unless we came running in with a open sucking wound, she's like, put some mercurochrome on it and get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's like, she was an emergency room nurse. She didn't want to mess around with these little things, you know, but, um, anyhow, the poem that I've written more recently about her, which is in the new poems is called ideas of heaven. And this just reimagines my mother, Uh, and her lifetime as a nurse. My mother's idea of heaven was a pulse, nurses in white spilling light across fields with hurricane lamps, bandage rolls, syringes, painkillers, stethoscopes, pressure cuffs, patilla hammers. Twice she almost died herself, and so knew heaven was not the light moving toward her, but the lights over the operating table. Those five blue spheres, a spaceship's landing gear, hovering above such alien beings as we are. My mother's idea of heaven was a jar of peanut butter and saltine crackers, a patient's chart and a pot of tea, notes scribbled in her elegant hand, more morphine, cortisone, a prowsman. Oh, I can never say that word, a prowsalam. It was a quorum of doctors in an elevator going up, blood swabbed from the walls, the smell of bleach following her to the next bed, the next crisis, the next head she would cradle like a baby, rubbing gravel from a wound with a green soap sponge, plastic gloves, IV stands, pocket light, iris scissors, forceps, thermometer, and her gold caduceus emblem pin, its coiled snakes and disembodied wings. Her shoes of breathable white leather, stain-resistant, slip-resistant, padded collars, four-ply pillow-top insole, their signature blue hearts. Her heaven was smoking Kents while feeding crows in the parking lot, the god of sleep, 20 minutes of uninterrupted unconsciousness. 
an abyssal cot in the break room next to a broken ventilator, flat on her back, her split shift night shift back, her spine with its bolts and bent crossbars, its stripped screws and bony overgrowths, fusions and cages and allographs. She was a shaft of light in the inner workings, her touch a tincture, a gauze dressing, a salve, a room temp saline bath. She microwaved blankets to slide over the dead, so when the ones who loved them filed in to say goodbye, the body felt warm under their hands. And that was Ideas of Heaven from uh, Dorian Lux's newest book. And um, that, that's one of the poems that got to me. Um, just the, the amount of love for your mother just comes through so strongly in that poem. And then, and then you kind of like read our minds because I'm thinking about that. And then you end with that, um, that, that act of love that she did with the blanket. And I just think, you know, if, if your goal in life should be to have somebody love you as much as the love that comes through in this poem, I think. Um, so that was really, really moving. So thanks for, well, I think we're all in love right now with nurses and doctors and we're so glad they spent all that time in school, stayed up late at night reading biology textbooks. And, you know, um, it, it's really not easy to become a nurse or a doctor. And I would argue that becoming a nurse is almost like becoming a doctor. They know as much. Their, their requirements are very, very tough. And we see all these selfless nurses and doctors doing what they're doing right now. And we just are in love with them, I think, in a way that we never have been before. So, yeah, yeah, I think so, too. I think, um, I think Banksy had a, a drawing recently. I don't know if you saw it yes. with the nurse as a superhero. And that was just that was great, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 In fact, the, um, I talked to one of the Pulitzer judges, and he said... Um, one of the things that really struck me about your book is how um, kind of prescient it was in the sense that it's about the life of this, a lot of it is the life of this nurse. And those are people that are right now so much in the news and on our minds and in our hearts. And uh, the amount of love that the country has shown uh, for those people is just overwhelming. And uh, so that was something that, you know, my mother, even from the grave, you know, she was always my, my um, staunchest supporter, you know, and even from the grave, she somehow reached out and said, you know, pick this book. <laughs> I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's definitely, I mean, one of the books, and I should mention for everybody that um, I have a reader's copy, so this is not the actual cover. But um, so don't look for this book when you look for it. Look for a different cover, which is red and yellow and green. There you go. Yeah. Oh, my hand. There you go. <laughs> and uh, and yeah. if you turn it sideways, it's an ocean with a sun oh. rise. I didn't. I didn't know that. Is it there looks a... like an abstract, but it's actually mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Is there a story behind you know why the one cover versus the other? Well. It was a mistake. Um, they asked me which cover I liked best. Mm -hmm. And I said the red and blue one, you know, or green or whatever. The colors are just so beautiful. And, uh, and it was a no-brainer for me. I thought this one. And they said, oh, no, you know, we, we thought you said the other one. And so we are already have the galleys with the other cover. Mm -hmm. and, but we'll go ahead and change it you know, back to the other one, but we won't be able to s change the galleys. It'll still have the clouds. Mm -hmm. I said, I love the clouds, mm -hmm. you know, the inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. 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 It is. So I got the best of both in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Happy um, accident. Yeah. Yeah. And that's from Norton and company, by the way, if anybody's wondering where they can find it. Um, well, I, I, let me let me say again, because we want this to be as interactive as possible. If you have any questions for Dorian, uh, just leave them in the chat window on either Facebook or YouTube, and I will pass them along. But um, let's hear another poem, uh, Dorian, if you don't mind. Well, I certainly don't mind. And uh, <clears throat> this is another poem from my mother that's in the new poems. And uh, it's the uh, title poem of the book. It's only as the day is long. And, and what page? And it's on page 134. That's the other downside of having the, um, 
the reader's copy is that there's no page numbers in the table of contents. So I, I, I all zeros. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. No. Only as the day is long. Soon she will be no more than a passing thought, a pang, a timpani of wind in the chimes, bent spoons hung from the eaves on a first night in a new house, on a block where no dog sings. No cat visits a neighbor cat in the middle of the street, winding and rubbing fur against fur, throwing sparks. Her atoms are out there, circling the earth, minus her happiness, minus her grief. Only her body's water atoms, her hair and bone and teeth atoms, her fleshy atoms, her boozy atoms, her saltines and cheese and tea. But not her piano concerto atoms, her atoms of laughter and cruelty, her atoms of lies and lilies along the driveway, and her slippers, Lord, her slippers, where are they now? That was the title poem from Only As the Day Is Long. Um, I was, as I was looking back to uh, the interview that we did in 1997 with you, um, you were talking about, um, um, I can't remember the word you used, um, but, but in a poetry reading, uh, sort of being um, uncomfortable, I think was the word you used, like, like making people, you know, have a space where they can sort of encounter new ideas was something you were talking about. You mentioned a, um, that somebody, somebody um, at a reading had said, um, now that we've you know, read a sad poem, here's a happy one to change your mood or whatever. And, and he said, like, what's wrong with being uncomfortable? Um, and it made me wonder, like, what do you think is the purpose of poetry? Like, what does poetry do for you? Like, why, why write a poem and share it? Like, what's, what's behind it? You know, um, I think it's different for everyone. But I think that there is, there are a number of constants that seem to come up over time. And one of them, I think, is that for people who have felt in any way silenced in their lives, um, are people that become poets. Um, Their voice has been tamped down, rejected, denied, something about the human voice. And, um, and so I think a poet speaks from that, what, what Lee Young Lee calls that, that deep wound, um, and that we sing from that wounding, that original wounding. Um, I think, you know, uh, for other people, uh, they grew up with a, a colorful uncle or aunt or or cousin, or somebody that introduced them to language and the possibilities of language. You know, they like my mother would always say, "Oh, Jesus Christ on a crutch," you know, <laughs> um, or you know, "Don't think you can boondoggle me," or you know, I mean, they had some way of speaking that suddenly woke you up to the possibilities of language. That it wasn't just for passing the salt. You know, it was for this kind of magical. Uh, uh, mystical, you know, uh, actual object in the air that you could manipulate and play with like clay or music or, you know, it could dance, it could sing. And, um, and so I think for some poets, they had somebody in their lives that, that gave that to them. Um, you know, why I know when I wrote for years and years and years on my own with no ever thought of an audience, I just wanted to speak back to others who had given me great pleasure by writing. Um, I read when I was young, and that was my respite, that was my place where I could be intimate with another human being that nobody else knew about except me. Mm -hmm. And it was my special friend, you know? And, um, and so I think that that was just my response to that great gift that I was given is I wanted to give that gift back. And I never thought of giving it outright 
to anyone. I just thought the act of doing it was like speaking to these people who had come before me. And then eventually, you know, um, I, I just started sharing, you know, poems and songs that I had written with friends. And, and then eventually I joined a workshop. And even then I wasn't sure that I wanted to publish these poems. And I remember Steve Cowett, my first teacher, saying to me, well, why, why wouldn't you want to publish them? And I said, well, it's so, it's so personal. It's so intimate. I, I just don't know. And he said, well, so you're hoarding your gift? You're hoarding your poems and you're keeping them all to yourself? He said, you know, and then I, later I read a book by Lewis Hyde called The Gift, and in that, Lewis Hyde talks about how whenever you write a poem, it feels like you've been given a gift. You know, often you'll look at the poem and say, I didn't write that. Who wrote that? I'm not smart enough to have written that, you know, um, or talented enough. Or where did that come from exactly? Well, <clears throat> it was a gift you were given, you know, either the talent for writing or that particular poem. And when you get a gift, when you receive a gift, it, it isn't a gift unless you then give it away. I mean, mm -hmm. give it to someone else, right? You know, that's the first thing instinctually you want to do when you read a beautiful poem. You did it at the beginning of this show. You read this poem. It was a gift to you, right? The first thing you wanted to do was give that gift away, to, right? Because mm -hmm. it was so wonderful and it was free. It was just given to you freely and you gave it freely. And now others will give that gift. And that creates community. Hmm. Everybody partakes of the gift, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that was a great answer. And there was a line that I actually wrote down, which that reminded me of. I don't remember which poem it's from. You said, it took me years to grow a heart from paper and glue, meaning books. And I, I always loved that line. And, hmm. um, and the other thing in the interview that I was reading, you talked about um, the, the, the sort of sense of losing yourself in a poem. And, um, and, and how you would sort of wake up and then not even realize that, you know, like what just happened, and then the poem appeared. And, yeah. um, and, and that's just an, uh, the amazing thing about poetry to me is that that happens. And, um, and do you have any, any idea how that happens? Like, how do you get into that space? It's magic, you know. <laughs> yeah, it um, is. My husband, Joe, <coughs> Joe <Joseph> Millar, <coughs> also a wonderful poet, um, says that it's uh, self-hypnotism. Hmm. He says, basically, you kind of hypnotize yourself and you go into a different realm. You go into a different part of your consciousness and that part of the consciousness knows everything, loves everything unjudgmentally, you know, um, just can put seemingly disparate things together and make them become whole mm -hmm. somehow. And, um, but you have to be hypnotized. You can't, you know, in fact, I, I mean, I know everybody experiences this when you're writing and you feel like you're writing, right? You go, oh, here I am <laughs> trying to write another poem. You know, maybe I'll say this or, oh, well, this would be clever. Or, well, maybe I could rhyme that, you know, you're thinking your way through it. And, um, or you're plodding through the narrative, you know. What is it? Joe calls it trapped like a rat in the narrative. You know, you're just, well, then this happened and this happened and this happened. But then something happens and the poem takes over and you're no longer in control of it. And it's just writing itself. And while that is happening to you, you're in this state where really people, People could walk in and out of the room. They could, you know, things could go on. But you are so immersed in that world that you're creating as you go. Um, no one can touch you. You're golden, you know, in those moments. And you know when you wake up from those moments, something special has happened. And you will do anything. You will wait any amount of time for it to happen again. It's like intermittent reinforcement, mm -hmm. you know. You never know when it's going to happen, but when it does, you're like, okay, you know, now let's see if I can make it happen again. Yeah, that was great. That was excellent. Um, let's see another example of that in action. What do you have <laughs> for us? Is, is that sunlight annoying? Is it bothering you? It's sort of Yeah, it bright. sort of is. I if you want to get up and change it, feel free. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, so this is great. I, I'd love get to talk to uh, Dorian. It's really uh, exciting here. And this book, uh, Only As the Day is Long, is just so good. You have to pick up a copy. But here she is. She's back. <laughs> I have to see if this is the right or the left. Yeah, I don't remember Who which. The sun was going to set. Yeah, I know. You'd think that they would <laughs> pause the sun for for, <laughs> for this episode. Right. Don't you realize I'm doing a poetry reading? <laughs> um. <clears throat> This is, I guess this is a fairly mother-centric reading here. Um, of course, you know, every time I write a book, I end up, you know, writing a poem shortly after it's published that would have been perfect for that book, right? You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I wrote Facts About the Moon, and immediately after it was published, I wrote these moon poems that would have been perfect. And then after the Book of Men, I wrote all these men poems that I thought, oh, God, these would have been perfect. And so here I've written another poem. And um, <clears throat> it's about my mother. And it's called Spirit Level, and uh, which I've always found to be a fascinating uh, word used to describe a level that you use when you're, making construct when you're constructing something. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also found the poem by Gary Snyder, the name of which I cannot remember right now, but, um, but he quote, this quote is from that poem, and he says, when making an axe handle, the pattern is not far off. And of course, that assumes you're making an axe handle with an axe. <clears throat> My mother was either horizontal on the couch or vertical, a plumb line from her spine to the top of her head to the ceiling that spins when she drinks, alcohol and an air bubble trapped, sealed, and fixed inside her, her face carved from wood, a tear gliding slowly down the curve of her cheek. My mother was once a spirit in this world. Once she breathed for me, above me, beside me, behind me. Now I feel her warm breath on my neck, summer nights, peering over my shoulder as I write every poem, whispering, let me in. I let her in. I remember every time she picked me up or set me down, put me to bed or woke me from dreams. And now I see how my whole life has been a dream, one she built for me from the ground up. Her daughter, my mother, the axe, beautiful tool with which she shaped me, a house much like the one she lived in, but smaller, fewer rooms, a tiny, unusable attic, and a cluttered basement. I let her in, like she let me in. She became my carpenter, stonemason, and bricklayer, piling me up cell by cell, the blade that shaped my legs, my arms, my surveyor, millwright. She used herself as a template. Her jeans tough, her organs elastic, her eyes and nose, forehead and mouth. And when her body, from which my body was made, was slipped into the hot retort, I burned too. She refused the beveled casket, <coughs> the oiled mahogany box, the last drawer for the dead, wanted only the fury of fire the blue-white flames unmaking her with their licking tongues. House, her grandmother built, and her grandmother before her, all of them giving what they had been given, the hardwood floors, staircases, and banisters, their deepest cupboards, their heavy doors flung wide, so the breeze I would be could blow through. Another beautiful poem that was spirit level. <coughs> uh, coughing attack there at the end <laughs> uh, it's, it's no problem if you need a drink of water or a pause don't worry about that at all um now we have a lot of great questions from the audience so i'm going to sort of let them take over now um, um you mentioned um uh, joseph millaris your husband and also yeah. a great poet uh, one of, a, a poet i love as well and uh, jim velvis says um, um, um do you and, and joe um, edit each other's poems um, he says he loves, he loves both your work too. Do you, do you work on poems together? Do you do you edit back and forth like that? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, we're 
the first person, even sometimes the only person that sees each other's poems before they go out into the world. Not always, but but most often. And um, and over the years, we've had to uh, kind of uh, keep a keep a lid on it a little bit because it's so convenient. You know, the person is right there, and you say, "Oh, <laughs> look, I just wrote this." You know. Which is fine, because you love hearing whatever they've written. But then they want to read you their, their second draft. And you go, okay, oh, great, you know. And then they want to read you the third and the fourth and the fifth. And, you know, <laughs> and you're going crazy. Like, if you read me one more draft of this poem, I'm going to fucking kill you. you know? <laughs> and so we try to be very circumspect about when we finally show that poem to the other person so that... It's close to what we think is finished before we, you know, uh, regale them with our with our creativity. <laughs> but um, but it really is lovely having another poet in the house and someone who is as good an editor as Joe is. He's very good grammarian, you know. He he tells me no, this should be lay, not lie, and you know I don't know that shit <laughs> and. Um, but he actually got a master's, you know, in English. And so uh, he's just, he's really perceptive and he knows when to dig deeper. He knows what to, to cut out, you know. And, uh, and hopefully I'm able to help him with his poems as well. Um, our fingerprints are all over each other's work. Mm -hmm. Um, so Michael Mark, um, who's a, an excellent poet in his own right, we've published him a bunch of times, but he, uh, he says, um, as accomplished as you are, what element of craft are you trying to improve on still? Well, <clears throat> you know, metaphor actually is really hard for me. And I love metaphor, not so much the singular use of it, but extended metaphor. And the times that it has been really successful has I haven't really thought about it. It just sort of occurred as I was writing. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to be able to get more conscious about how to use metaphor um, in interesting ways, you know. So I've been playing with that a little bit. Form, uh, you know, when I was young and I first started writing, as I said, for myself, I thought poetry was all, of course, and rhymed and metered. And so I, for years as a child, from 12 to, you know, probably 20, you know, I wrote rhymed, metered poems. And they were horrible. And, uh, but it was great training, you know. But then, of course, I stopped. You know, I, I started reading free verse poets and, and I, I, you know, left form completely. And I never returned to it. It's not like I was writing sonnets. You know, I was writing doggerel <laughs> is what I was writing, you know. But it taught me about meter and, you know, and rhyme. And, um, and so now I've gotten back to form. And, but really, you know, received forms versus doggerel, which is, I guess, <laughs> a sort of received form. And um, I would like to get good at it so that I could, I would love to be able to write a Villanelle. I would, anything but a Sistina. I do not, you know, the Sistinas drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, I always, when I see a Sistina, I think, oh, there's an MFA student. They had, you know, Sistina was their final project. <laughs> you know. but, um, but there are a lot of forms that I think are really devastatingly powerful. And I would love to be able to have more facility with them. Yeah, it's funny because um, um, Kim Adonizio, who you know you're good friends with and wrote the Poets Companion <laughs> with, she had a Sistina, and I had to confess to her in our in our uh, spring issue, and I had to confess like that's my I love formal poetry, but that's my least favorite form. Yeah. Um, so it was cool that she had one that worked out that you know that I, had sort I, of a purpose. It, I, I don't know. I'm not a fan of the Sistina either. Yeah. Well, you know, Kim is really brilliant when it comes to form. I mean, her sonnets, if you read, um, uh, which is it, Tell Me? Mm -hmm. Is it Tell Me that has all the sonnets in it? Philosopher's Club, or, too. No, it's Philosopher's yeah, Club. Yeah, that, that Philosopher's might Club. be my favorite book. I love that's the sonnets in that book. I could recite several of them. <laughs> oh, I know. They're just unbelievable. 
um, I swear she has a kind of mathematic algorithmic mind, you know. And um, when I showed that book to Al Poulin at BOA, I said, and he read it and he said, oh, I love this, you know, this book by your friend. And, um, and I said, didn't you just love the sonnets? And he said, there were sonnets? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that whole, you know. And he said, wait a minute. And he goes back and he's, I said, oh, my God. And it's not like Al didn't know sonnets. He had just written a crown of sonnets. He was way familiar with the form. But they're so good. Mm -hmm. that you don't even notice it. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what I love about that. That, that might be what that might be my actual favorite book is The Philosopher's yeah. Club. Um and and it's because of that. It's because the, the those sonnets that you that don't feel at all. I mean just the enjambment and the clever use of the rhyme. It's and just amazing. Inventive, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. Um so maybe this plays along with that, but Sam Clemens asks um um is there a former style of poetry that you wish you saw more of uh, that seems to be missing these days? A former style? A form or style, yeah. A form or style. You know, I, I can't say that. I, it seems like right now we're living in the um, renaissance of poetry. I don't think there is a form or style that somebody hasn't people are bringing back forms mm -hmm. and styles, right? You know? Um, and so, you know, except for future forms and styles, I, you know, which are clearly missing mm -hmm. <laughs> because they haven't been invented yet. Yeah. And they're inventing them, you know, Terrence Hayes and Jericho Brown and, you know, people are inventing style forms. So I would say no. Yeah. <laughs> In a word. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my that would have been my answer too. I mean, the I was gonna say the golden shovel and the Lenin lyric, you know. Um, so it, it, and everybody's just trying everything. It's really the I think it's the golden age of poetry we're living in, and there's so many people writing it that are so talented, and there's there's brilliant poets that um, you've never I've never heard of as an editor, you know, and reading poems yeah. all day every day, and then um, I'm shocked to find an amazing poem by someone that I look it up and they've written eight books and I never heard of them. It's an amazing time to like poetry. Yeah, 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 it really is. And um, <clears throat> if I can just lasso this uh, this uh, interview, the golden shovel form, I was so afraid of it. And when, when Terrence wrote and said, you know, I'd like you to write a golden shovel, these are the rules. Or It wasn't actually Terrence, but it was this guy that was making the anthology of these poems. And he said, yeah, it's simple. You just take a line by Gwendolyn Brooks and use all the, the words in the line, and it's the last words in the, in the poem. And I said, okay. Now, I was terrified of the form, but I love puzzles. <laughs> and to me, it was a puzzle. And I thought, okay, you know, I can do this puzzle. And, um, and so the line is, which is a brilliant line by Gwendolyn Brooks, I am not deceived. I do not think it is still summer. I just think that is the most evocative line, you know. And um, so I chose that line. And then I wrote my own poem. And it was published in that anthology. And Mark Doty, I think, reprinted it on his Facebook page. And somebody said, I really like this poem, but I think the line breaks are really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> because he didn't realize, of course, that I was following mm -hmm. this form. So there are weird line breaks, you know, and uh, that don't seem to make any contemporary American poetry sense at all, let alone formal poetry sense or, you know. So anyway, I was going to read the poem, but then I realized, you know, oh, well, yeah, you do. It's on page 127. Oh, OK. Yeah, let's do that then. Let's yeah. do two poems. We, we're sort of talking more than reading and we want to share a bunch of poems, okay. too. Yeah, so, so what, what page line, did you say? One twenty one. It's one twenty seven. One twenty seven. Okay. And it's the p first poem in um, the twenty poems that I new poems that I write about my mother called Laps. I am not deceived. I do not think it is still summer. I see the leaves turning on their stems. 
I am not oblivious to the sun as it lowers on its stem, not fooled by the clock holding off, not deceived by the weight of its tired hands holding forth. I do not think my dead will return. They will not do what I ask of them, even if I plead on my knees, not even if I kiss their photographs or think of them as I touch the things they left me. It isn't possible to raise them from their beds, is it? Even if I push the dirt away with my bare hands, stillness, unearth their faces, bring me the last dahlias of summer. And that was Laps from uh, Dorian's new book, Only As the Day Is Long. And you can read the end here. I am not deceived. I do not think it is still summer. So if you don't know the golden shovel form, that's it. And of course, it doesn't have to be Gwendolyn Brooks, but that it started out with a Gwendolyn Brooks poem by Terrence Hayes that, that he created cool. the form. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. real cool, yeah. yeah. Um, here, let's hear something else. Okay, and um, from the, um, the news section, I mean, since I read Laps, um, I was working toward her lines, and uh, I had been doing that with sonnets. I knew I couldn't write a sonnet, uh, in that it's very difficult for me to rhyme while I'm writing and um, and have it sound natural. And um, so I thought I would steal the words, the end words from a poem that I loved, which was um, John Donne's uh, Holy Sonnet, number seven. And um, I was reading him a lot after my mother died. And so I read that poem and for some reason, those words, I thought I could use those in a poem. So every final word is John Donne's word. Death of the mother. At the round earth's imagined corners, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise. At day's end, last sight, sound, smell, and touch, Blow your final breath into the hospital's disinfected air. Rise from your bed, mother of eight, the blue scars of infinity lacing your belly, your fractious hair and bony knees, and go where we can never find you, where we can never overthrow your lust for order, your love of chaos, your tyrannies of despair, your can of beer. Cast down your nightshade eyes and float through the quiet. Your nightgown wrapped like woe around your shredded soul. Your cavernous heart. That space you left us like a gift. Brittle staircase of ifs we are bound to climb too often and too late. Unleash us. Let your grace breathe over us in silence when we can bear it ground as we are into our loss. You taught us how to glean the good from anything. Pardon anyone, even you, awash as we are in your blood. That was Death of the Mother from uh, Dorian's newest book. Um, one of the things that I was, um, I, you know, looking back at that old interview from 23 years ago, you, you said something that um, I've never seen anyone else say uh, which is that you originally you were performing your poems. You had to memorize and you were very theatrical and you moved, you know, you had a lot of movement going on. And then you realized that um, that, that, that distracted from the language itself. Um, and, and that was just interesting. Can you talk about your, um, your, your idea of presentation and what you try to do? <coughs> um, I, you know, I think there are people that can present their poems in a performative way and they're brilliant. You know, they can do it brilliantly. I think that um, as I began doing it, it felt very studied. It felt very, um, you know, uh, people would come up to me. I mean, this is how I ended up even thinking about it was that people would come up to me after a reading and instead of saying something like that poem really moved me or that poem made me think of this or I love the way that you use this or that or, 
you know, this metaphor, or the language or the song of it, you know, any number of things they might have said. But instead, they'd say, I can't believe you had the whole thing memorized. <laughs> yeah. And that would be the comment over and over again. People were so enthralled. And then they would say, they'd follow that by saying, and I love watching your hands because you just speak the poem with your hands and it's so beautiful. And oh my God. And I kept thinking, well, what about the poem? I mean, was the poem okay? Did you enjoy it? Or was it the performance of it that you enjoyed so much? And so then I started putting my hands in my pockets mm. and and just saying the words because I loved the words so much that I didn't want anything to distract from them. I love mouthing language and I love enunciation and I you know and that's me that's what I love and um so I I decided to stop doing it. I still have all my poems memorized. Mm -hmm. But I always look down anyway because I'm getting older too. <laughs> yeah, and um, and it's harder as you get older. And you have a, a lot of poems and books now that they kind of pile up. And I have so <laughs> many now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I am um, in the process of writing. When I, I only have one book, but I wrote that, and just in the process of writing, I would memorize them sort of by accident, not on purpose. So I sort of had them all up there. And yeah. Um, yeah, but I never heard anybody say that that you shouldn't do that. So that was a really interesting yeah, thing I to hear. I don't say that you should not shouldn't. Sorry, I yeah. shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I felt like I that it wasn't right for me and for the kind of poem that I was reading. And often the poem's emotion was more subtle than the presentation would allow it to be. And I wanted the subtlety you know um <clears throat> and it felt like like gilding the lily a little bit you know to mm -hmm. be presenting it often in, in that way but i as i said i think some people are really brilliant and they can bring out the emotion in a poem or they can bring out the language so that you really hear it in a way that you don't hear it on the page or so you know it was just it was just me yeah. And there are times when I do, like I've done readings where I will I will recite a short poem of mine or something to begin the reading. I just, you know, say it straight to the audience. And it's often very effective because you're speaking directly <coughs> to the audience. <coughs> and I will sometimes do it without introduction. I will just walk up to the to the lectern and say, someone spoke to me last night. Hmm told me the truth just a few words but i recognized it and they think that i'm just speaking to them but i'm speaking a poem you know and then i'll go and and do my reading so i'm not saying it can't be effective and that you can't do it but um i think whole readings like that were a little much it was like a theatrical it was like hamilton or something <laughs> yeah well that's really cool to hear and, it, and it's you know, well you know, maybe not like hamilton <laughs> but I mean, I, you know what i mean yeah i wish it were like hamilton well one thing that we haven't talked about yet that i wanted to is that um you're one of the original um, people who set up the, i think if i understand right the um pacific university's writing program um, um and that is such an amazing program I think um, of our. I think we've had fifteen Rattle Poetry Prize winners, and I think four yeah. have come from that program. And then all these other poets are just amazing. Like, if there's a poet that I don't know, I don't recognize the name, and then I, I, I'm unsurprised to find that they came from that program. Yeah. So, um, so can you just talk a little bit about your philosophy for that program and just for teaching poetry in general? Um, like, what do you? How do you go about like making good poets? Well, you know, I don't think I, any of us makes a good poet. I mean, a good poet makes themselves. And you, you can recognize and identify their, either their potentiality or their, you know, their greatness. And, uh, and so you go about nurturing that. And you go about finding things for them to read um, that you think will further that that greatness that's in them, you know. And uh, so I think I spend most of my time as a teacher uh, 
you know, guiding them toward literature that I think they can learn a lot from. And I do the same thing that my teacher did with me. You know, I introduce them to the world poets. I introduce them to poets they may have never heard of. I spend a lot of time teaching them, uh, of course, dead poets in the sense of, of the canon, but also dead poets like Larry Levis and Deborah Diggs and um, Bell Waring and poets who died too young and that will never be read unless we keep them alive. You know, my students, when they read Larry Levis, well, he's not out there doing readings, publishing books, you know. Deborah Diggs isn't furthering her career, you know. Um, and so we have to do that for them. And uh, <clears throat> so most of my time as a teacher is spent doing that. And one of the things I love about Pacific is that we created it to be a non, um, you know, we didn't want it to be scholarly. You know, I mean, if you want to do a scholarly program, you know, get a PhD or, you know, go to a residency MFA program because you'll be exposed to literature on a wider, you know, um, scale. But here it's really, we're teaching you how to read like a writer. We're teaching you, you know, how to um, discipline yourself, you know, um, without anybody else. I mean, you, you know, it's all about you. And um, so it's very informal. It's very, it's filled with good humor. I mean, people are constantly joking and playing tricks on each other and gaming around and I think it's because we know poetry is so so serious it's such a serious endeavor and I so admire anybody that devotes their life to poetry because it's a ridiculous thing to devote your life to nobody cares you know and but we do and so we love each other we support each other we make each other laugh and we say you know it's okay to go ahead and do this thing that will not bring you any pleasure at all, you know, (laughs) except in the making of it, you know, and the giving away of it. And um, so it's that kind of program. Um, When they write their, their, um, when they do their thesis semester, their final project, it's all about them as a writer and what they've learned from other writers and how they've integrated that into their own work and how they kind of feel that that's helped them become the writer they can be, you know. So it's not so much an emphasis on, you know, literature or scholarly pay- research, you know, unless you call research reading the f- complete works of Anne Sexton and falling in love with her and, you know, Mm -hmm. knowing everything there is. I mean, you can do that. It doesn't have to be the traditional scholarly research project. You can do it for pleasure, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's that's the the spirit of it. We're all together. We're all supporting each other. And we're doing something supremely stupid together. (laughs) Well, that's a that's a great perspective. But what you're doing really works. I mean, the poets coming out of that program there there's two that stand out. There's the SUNY Binghamton uh, with Maria Gillen, and then mm-hmm. there's the Pacific program. And just at least the style of poetry that we like to read, which is sort of more down to earth and you know just engaging and maybe a little less academic. Um, but we just love those two programs. So um, yeah, thank you for doing that. Um, and I should say before we go, um, you know there. Um, Gosh, between the four platforms, there's like 200 people watching this live. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And there's so many good comments, I can't pass them along. But like Michelle Bidding, who I think you know, says, you to bomb, mama. <laughs> and, um, and some people just say they love your reading and, and certain like, lines made them tear up and stuff. So thanks so much for, for joining us uh, today. Dorian, do you want to close out with one last poem? Um, it should be a short one, right? Anything you want. We, there's really no time limit, but um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, though. Okay, so um, this is a poem I've been ending my readings with lately. Um, And it's called, In Any Event. In any event, if we are fractured, 
we are fractured like stars, bred to shine in every direction through any dimension, billions of years since and hence. I shall not lament the human, not yet. There is something more to come. Our hearts a gold mine, not yet plumbed, an uncharted sea. Nothing is gone forever. If we came from dust and will return to dust, then we can find our way into anything. What we are capable of is not yet known. And I praise us now in advance. Oh, thanks so much. That was In Any Event, a new poem by Dorian Lux. Uh, thanks so much again for joining us. It's just been such a pleasure to, um, to hear just your beautiful poems that I've always loved and um, just great, great discussion too. Thanks so much for joining us, Dorian. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, so that was Dorian Lux um, and her book, which this is not the cover of, remember, but only as The Day is Long from Norton. Um and uh, you know, I, I recommend the books that we uh, we share on these on these rattlecasts every time. But um, this is an especially good one. So pick it up. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, of course, you can find it where any anywhere books are sold. But uh, from Norton directly, their website is www.norton.com, of course. And uh, that was Dorian Lux. So um, excellent show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, now we're gonna have open lines like we always do to close out a show. But first, let me let you know um, that um, tomorrow, uh, because we, we postponed this reading, um, given all that's going on in the world, um, it didn't feel right to have um, an episode last week. But um, so we moved this to when, to Monday. Usually these Rattlecasts were Tuesday. And tomorrow, that's Tuesday, June 9th, we're doing another Rattlecast. Less than, um, how many hours away is that? Like 14 hours from now or no? Uh, 17 hours from now. I can do math in my head even though I'm a poet. Um, uh, Rattlecast number 45 is going to feature Mark Allen DiMartino uh, in his book Unburial. Uh, we published him twice now. Uh, he's an, a poet living in Italy. So because he's in Italy and it's like 2 a.m. there right now or 3 a.m. or something, we move the time up. So it will be tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time, noon uh, Pacific time. So join us then for another Rattlecast like really, really soon. <laughs> um, so that'll be tomorrow. Now for the for the open lines, we're going to do two things. We have the prompt poem as we always do. And um, we have the, we're going to do something a little different and just see how this goes. I'm wondering if we have an open mic this time for recently published poems. So if you have a poem that's been published recently, um, you can join in. Let me show you the numbers here. Um, the phone number is 818-850-7727. Uh, just call, let it ring a few times, and hang up, and I'll see you on my list, and I'll call you back when the time is right. You can also send a chat message to Rattle Poetry, all one word, over Skype. So just go to, go, go uh, open up your Skype app, type in Rattle Poetry, all one word, send me a chat message, and say you'd like to read a poem, and um, you, can, you can read it, and I'll call you back when the time is right. So we're going to do poems for a prompt, but if you have any other recently published poems you'd like to celebrate and share with everybody watching, uh, feel free to give me a call and share that. You can send an email to openmike at rattle.com at the same time with a link to the poem or um, if it's online or with a text of the poem so people can read along and, 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 and share your work. Um, and if you just want to call in and tell me where I can find it online, uh, that'll work too. So feel free to do that. That's 818-850-7727 or... A Skype message to Rattle Poetry. So the, the prop for this week, which was actually like two weeks ago now, um, was write a poem based... Oh, wait, no. I made a mistake. That's this week's prompt. Ignore the next week. This should say last week. The last week's prompt was, with your eyes closed, open any book to a random page, make the title of your poem the first word that you see. That was last week's prompt. And um, here's Megan's poem. I'll share my poem tomorrow. Uh, this was Megan's poem for, uh, for the prompt last week. This was Bridled. Uh, and Bridled, she found a Wikipedia entry about Bridled. A scold's bridle, sometimes called a witch's bridle, a Branks bridle, or simply Branks, was an instrument of punishment. 
as a form of torture and public humiliation. The device was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head. The Kirk Sessions and Barony Courts in Scotland inflicted the contraption mostly on female transgressors and women considered to be rude, nags, or common scolds. That's from Wikipedia for the word bridled. And here's Megan's poem, Bridled. It was supposed to make us look broken, no doubt. Tie a dog to a chain long enough, it turns limp, docile, a worm on a leash. We were supposed to soften. But in the illustration, in the illustrations, we look fierce, dangerous. Why else would you seal what was made to be as open as a storming sky? They forget that eyes speak too, and hers are laughing. Board up the gates of hell. They want to drive their stakes into the earth, but we have no give. They want us to be horses, but look at that one there, running across the plains, black as an iron. See her mane of black foam, the way she rears up, a wave in an angry sea that no one, not even God, can tame. That was Megan's poem for her own prompt. She's the one who makes these prompts every week. That was bridled by uh, Megan Green. And um, and I will share my poem tomorrow. Tomorrow, um, since we, we kind of messed up the the schedule we're just doing the same prompt for both weeks so if you're if you're uh, watching this after the fact and you want to share your bridal poem tomorrow at uh 3 p.m eastern or noon pacific uh, feel free to do that then but let's see who would like to go now um here's angela gartner call her up i think she was on a poetry spun live this weekend Hey, Angela. Uh, we hear you. We don't see you quite yet. Oops. Oh, do you see me? All right. Um, not yet, but we can hear you. <laughs> okay, here you come. Hello. I Hello. am. I'm good. How are you? So we, you, you have good. a prompt poem, which you just emailed. Perfect. And uh, yeah. this is for the prompt for this week. Um, and it's called Forgotten. Um, are you ready to read it, or do you want to introduce anything about it? Well, I mean, because uh, it was the prompt for a couple weeks ago, and um, I've been reading a lot of plays because I'm in a class right now, um, a theater class, and um, the bald, like a bald soprano by Eugene Isaacona, and um, it's I, I opened my play and I the word forgotten came up, oh. so that's and then I just started writing, but it's. It's uh, definitely about someone who, it's funny because um, it's about someone who I loved and who has passed away. So it's funny. Um, it, it's not my mom, but it's someone who was very close to me. So Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing. Here it comes. Um, I got it up for everybody to read. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. It's been seven years since her name was last said. No one understood, not even me. We didn't want to believe. Her frame was withering away, the darkness around her eyes, a pain in her stomach that wouldn't subside. I remember her hand reaching out to me. It was one of comfort, but I slinked away. Her face turned into a frown. I let her down, the woman who sung my praises. I'd forgotten why I didn't want to feel even a graze just then. But I still remember the look of her fragile hand. Her touch would be welcome. So would her voice, her face, and everything. The guilt doesn't leave. This moment remains forever engraved in my heart and mind. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. And that was um, Angela Gartner once again reading uh, Forgotten. Yeah, th yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that and for calling in. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Okay. Um... Let's see. So we have um, Caitlin Buxbaum and Brentopolis. Let's do Brentopolis. And we'll see if he... Let's see. Did someone's name Brent? This must be Brent Stauffer, I assume. Hey, Brent. Is this Brent Stauffer? Oh, I can't hear you. I, I don't have any mic. Hmm. Yeah, I don't hear you. I have no sound. Um... Um, if you give me, if you text me your phone number, I can just call you on the phone, but I don't have any, um, we don't have any audio for you. 
Okay. Yeah. Text me. Use the chat and send me your phone number. Okay. Um, yeah, that happens sometimes. I think what happens actually, if you're uh, just through trial and error, I've realized is that um, um, what happens is that if you use a program that uses a microphone, sometimes that'll sort of hijack your microphone, and then Skype won't be able to take it over. But let's do um, let's do Caitlin Buxbaum. And, uh, and we'll call, uh, Brent's going to give me his phone number. We'll just do it over the phone for Brent. Um, Caitlin, are you there? Okay. Hello. Here we are again, where I have <laughs> you playing in the background and calling me at the same time. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, you're good now? Okay. Let me pull you yeah, in. Yeah, I could just, I could never mute it fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish there was a better way, I, I don't know, a way to like warn you what we really need is a board op so we can have somebody say like caitlin you're going next i need like a, a sidekick yeah what's that guy you know on um the stern show that's like famous or i don't know, oh, I I don't know, know. either <laughs> but we need some we need some person in the corner like doing stuff so i don't have to do it but anyway yeah um but what did you want to share today caitlin did you want to do a prompt well, or did you want to do another poem we're totally open now I'm open-ended a little conflicted but since you're uh, asking for a new publication, I thought maybe I read one of my prompt poems mm -hmm. and one of the poems from my oh, book. Sure, yeah, that's yeah, with you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so I need to send you the one from my book because I did not send you that okay. one. Um, do you want me to send that to open? Yeah, mic? send that to open mic right now. And um, okay, I gotta find your other poem. And too. then okay, so I see I see the poems. Yeah, here. so I have three. I have death, missing, and ideas. <laughs> So I think uh, I mentioned it in the email, but I'm reading three books right now. So like when when you sent out the prompt, I was like, oh, I want to do one from each book. Um, but I think I'm, the one I'm going to read is uh, Missing. Okay. And I'm just trying to find my... Ah, I had it ready and now I don't. Where'd it go? I was trying to send you the... Okay, well, we'll read that and then I'll send it to you. Well, I have Missing, the... so... Well, yeah, I was looking for the um, the one of my published poems. Oh, I'm almost there. Okay, Hold on. okay we're already. <laughs> uh... Okay, just sent you another one, and I will read Missing. Okay. This is a, a guzzle, which I thought was gazal for the longest time, and then I keep hearing people pronouncing it the other yeah, it's way. It's the same way. And people this who one... read a lot have no idea how anything's pronounced, so neither do, neither do I. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this word came from Catch-22, which there was some controversy about that book recently in my hometown. Oh, really? So what was that? What, what controversy it. would be? Oh, I'll send you the news <laughs> stories. Um, but so basically over the last year, we had our curriculum council in our school district um, come up with some curriculum for English three and four, because previously there hadn't been anything. It was basically just like anything goes. And so they're like, well, we should have a book list. So they come up, they spend a year coming up with this book list, pitch it to the school board. And the school board says, no, this book is inappropriate for high schoolers, even though these are elective classes. And then the catcher the whole, in the, the rye. What, what's it inappropriate? Right? He says like damn once and masturbates. Is that not, <laughs> not catcher in the rye? Um, catch oh, catch 22. 22. Well, even, okay. Catch 22. Well, even that, what's inappropriate? Well, that that's even guess worse else, guess what else was on the list the great gatsby <laughs> so that it's yeah it's that's a whole funny. thing i'll yeah. send you the well, list they should but... not look at tiktok if they uh <laughs> <laughs> if they think that they're censoring anything but anyway let, let's hear your uh, you're yeah. missing okay which voices are missing from this latest conversation left out by death and ignorance all across the nation I'm listening for the damned, but all I hear is silence in the wake of violence spreading all across the nation. What war is it we're fighting now? Drugs, disease, or terror? Who will claim responsibility for this child nation? I'm looking for the fallen, broken, and downtrodden, but still have trouble facing the crimes across the nation. What will you do, dear reader, armed with this information? How will you find the missing within this burning nation? Yeah, that was missing from the prompt. That's a word out of uh, Catch-22, not Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. um, is the other poem short? 
Okay. Yes. Let's, let's do that one too. Okay. Oh yeah, it's really short. Okay. Yeah. At a poet's. Did you yeah, get at a that? poet's lecture on tones of voice. Yep. And I wrote this um, last October, I think. Um, anyway, and for anyone who doesn't know, Cedar Saigo is a Washington poet, um, Native American. I think he grew up on the reservation there, um, or a reservation. I don't know if there's more than one. So, at a poet's lecture on tones of voice. What if these encroaching fits of musicality, as Cedar Saigo said, are all we poets have from the beginning and at the end of our struggling orchestrated existence? Whatever future we sing of, whatever fate is plucking the strings, perhaps our words are all we need to sustain beauty, find inner peace, and it will have to be enough. Oh, thanks so much. I love that quote, the encroaching fits of musicality. Um, yeah, and I, I couldn't find it in his work. I think he just, he said, just said it said in it. his <laughs> lecture, and I was like, I had to write a poem about well, that. That's cool. Well, um, thanks so much for sharing that, Caitlin. I appreciate both of those. Yeah, thanks for giving me the airtime. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. Okay, but Okay, so let's see. Let's... Um, okay, so, uh, so Brent, we'll try Brent again over Skype. Um, he says he thinks the mic's going to work now. Let's see, Brent, can you, you can hear me. Can I hear you? Hello? I still have no sound. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any sound. I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, just, yeah. Um, let's see. Did he leave a phone number? Yeah, we, Brent, just leave a phone number and I'll call you. Okay. Um, let's do Carla Schwartz. We haven't seen her in a while. This is over the phone. I don't think there's any video option. Hi. Hey, Carla. Hi. It's uh, Tim with Rattle, of course. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Great. How I'm you... good. I'm good. We're out of sync, but I'm fine. Let me make sure that I have my vid my audio off on the... Yeah, yeah, go ahead and mute that. And then uh, you had a prep poem, I think. I do, I do. Yeah. Okay, you... the title chosen from a random book, and the word was heat. Yes. And um, we actually got rid of all the books, so I can't even tell you which book it was. But it was a book <laughs> on camping. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but uh, and actually, oh, no, no, this isn't the case. Um, I just want to say that coincidentally, I just got accepted another poem that's a golden shovel based on a line of a Dorian Lux. Oh, wow. Um, what a coincidence. See, this um, is the thing I'm talking about. Every week, there's like weird coincidences that uh, make yeah. me feel like there is, you know, there's a higher power taking the time somehow to make us have weird coincidences. I don't know what's going on, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's weird. Okay, but this is, the word is heat. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Heat, you exhaust me, but I sense your work in the water I swim in. Today I avoid you. Take a dip in the shade of an oak, a dip in the pond, a slip inside to water the plants, grab a nap. When I move belly to belly with my husband, we conjure you. A hot shower after a cold swim, you soak in. Muscles, bones, I purr to you. Today, I almost fainted under your weight. I love you when I feel cold. Tire easily when you manifest bombast. Lately, you have shown little humility. Squat down. Take a knee. We're sweating bullets here. Awesome. That was Carla Schwartz, who, of course, you can find at CB99 videos everywhere. And uh, that was her poem, Heat, from the prompt. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. I really enjoyed oh, it. Thank you so much, Tim, and for everything. It was a great yeah. night. Oh, it's always my pleasure. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, yeah. Okay. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, let me try. I'm going to do uh, this 425 number. Then, uh, then Brent gave his phone number, so I'll call Brent back. But first, let's do this 425 number. Somebody just called and um, left a message, so we'll see who that is. 
Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem for the open mic? Oh, yes. I have to find it. One moment. <laughs> no problem. And who am I talking to? This is Chris Beaver in Kirkland, Washington. Ah, hey, Chris. Good to hear from you. Um, Hi. I have your poem. I, I show it right here already. It's Fish Bones. Fish Bones. My father used to smoke steelhead, salmon, and sturgeon on our patio. The thick, sweet scent of hickory and marinade drifted into the house. I imagined each fish, its wet flesh and slippery scaled skin transforming from raw to flaky, rich with flavor. And after what seemed like ages, he'd pull them out of the smoker, still whole, their eyes gone gold, mouths open in surprise, almost grinning. Even their bones became a wiser, pliable form of skeleton. This happens to most creatures trapped in trouble. What they used to be is no longer. That doesn't mean they're destroyed, just different, infused with new purpose. After grief has eaten, eaten what there is to devour, the bones still retain shape of what they once held. Awesome. Thanks so much Thank for sharing you. that. Yeah, that was Fish Bones, and that was from, um, um, I don't want to show your email address. It was from meniscus.org. Uh, is there anything you want to say? Menis meniscus Literary Journal. Um, is there anything yeah, you want to say about... Yeah, it's out of New Zealand. Um, they published two of my poems, and the other one was one that started as a prompt from Rattle, too. Oh, cool. Um, about back when you had that wonderful whale. Um, watercolor. Ah. Oh, very cool. It's always good to hear that they, those find a home uh, afterwards. Yeah. Too. yeah, yeah. Well, very cool. And that's meniscus.org, M-E-N-I-S-C-U-S dot org dot A-U right. from Australia. Yeah. They publish twice a year. Uh -huh. Very cool. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Chris, Tim. for sharing that. Yeah, it's always a pleasure awesome to, night. to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I love Dorian, so it was really a lot of fun for me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so great. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, let's go back to, um, um, and, and we have Dick Westheimer too. Let's try to get, get him as well, but we'll do, uh, we'll get back to Brett first. <clears throat> You've reached Brent's voicemail. Please uh, leave a message. He went straight Thanks. to voicemail. Okay, let's hang up on this and see who's calling from a 205. <laughs> Hello, this Bye -bye. is Tim with uh, Rattle. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I, I, I hear you just fine. It's coming through the phone, but um, <laughs> not through the Skype. I don't know what's happening with that. Yeah, I don't know. So who am I talking to? Oh, this is Brent. Oh, Brent awesome. I'm, gl I'm glad we found you. Okay, so this is Brent, um, Brent Stauffer, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, yeah. cool. Well, I'm glad we could connect. So uh, you had a poem from the prompt called Being. But first of all, yeah. where, where are you calling from? Uh, Birmingham. Awesome. And uh, is there anything you want to say about you know where this poem came from or anything? Well, um, I I uh, I got the, I usually go to um, a, um, a a book of um, Hafiz that uh, Daniel Lenitsky, uh translated, if you want to call it translated, when I do by bibliomancy, mm -hmm. and so I got the word being. And I thought, oh, well, that's not too big of a subject. Um, <laughs> and um, what the way the poem came out was a total surprise to me. And one thing that might be helpful to know is that the Igbo people were famous for committing suicide on the way over from Africa rather than live as enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's so, hear it. It's being is the poem. Okay. How many scattered bones of young Igbo men and women line the unseen floor of the Atlantic? The strange question of whether to be or not is often mused by a pampered pale throat concerned with matters noble and philosophical. It's a matter of tautological fact. You can't breathe if you can't breathe. You can't breathe free if you can't breathe at all. The officer hand in pocket as if leaning against a lamppost, with the dark weight of centuries 
kneeled into George Floyd's windpipe until his last gasp escaped in a rush of fire. Oh, thanks for sharing that. that you know, as if leaning against a lamppost, doesn't that encapsulate it? Yeah, that was what just the indifference of it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much for putting up with my uh, technical incompetence and getting, getting through to me. <laughs> it's no problem. Yeah, I don't know. We had a great video, but the uh, audio, we just couldn't hear any audio. So um, maybe we could try it some other time off camera and, and figure it out. But but thanks for sharing. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was uh, Brent Stoffer, I should say, uh, reading his poem, Being. Thanks for sharing that, Brent. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, have a good night. You too. Okay, let's do one more. Um, I know Dick... Westheimer wanted to do it, but he was on just Sunday. Maybe Dick can do it tomorrow, or Richard Westheimer. Um, but let me call back this uh, 773 number and see who that was while they're here. Uh, so for tomorrow, we'll do the same prompts. I'll, I'll share my prompt poem, and um, other people might have uh, had this prompt. We'll do that tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern after uh, Mark. Hello? Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem for uh, the open mic? I do. Um, <laughs> this is Jessica from Chicago. Oh, hey, Jessica. <laughs> Good to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. One of our uh, regular <laughs> viewers. It's always nice to have have some regulars. Um, um, yeah, I, so you know what? I actually, last week I wrote this poem um, from the prompt, and I, if I'm being super honest and um, really narcissistic, I fell in love with it, so I'm not sharing it. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually going to submit it to you some other time. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, please do. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, you know what, though? You uh, can you can share it and submit it if you want. I mean, it, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's always weird. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, I was... Well, I meant, like, because, like, if you already read it, and then, yeah. like, it comes up later, it's like, mm, I don't know how, like, does that fly, you know? So. Yeah, it is true. We try to do, like, blind reading... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I never know what to do with this kind of thing either. But yeah, is there something else you want to read <laughs> instead, though? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, like, I literally just sent it in the last five minutes. Um, is it Departure? It's Departure. Yeah, okay, yeah. I have it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say, because I feel like, so this prompt is really damn cool. I've loved all of these prompts. and um, But just doing it, with one word from a book doesn't really tell you where it's from. So I love when people have been saying like, this is where it's come from, like from a play. Mm -hmm. um, this departure is actually chapter three um, because I turned to, <laughs> I didn't even turn to a page with words on it. I just turned <laughs> to a chapter title, um, but it's from Ray Bradbury, something wicked this way comes. Oh, cool. Um, so here is a, a strangely dark poem uh, called departure. Okay. Okay. We are in a constant state of departure, spinning slowly on our tilted continents, hanging out in our destroyed orchards. We're in a constant state of departure, but we're always reaching further, farther, eager to escape any consequence. We're in a constant state of departure, spinning slowly on our tilted continents. Very nice. Thanks so much. That was uh, Jessica Dawson from Chicago reading Departure. I love the, the, the refrain there. It's, um, you guys, uh, Rattle has turned me on to Triolet, or I don't know if I'm saying it right, but, um, I think they say I'm like, Triolet, but, but I have no idea. Triolet. Oh, that, that's how, fancier. Yeah, yeah, it sounds fancier, and, and we all, you know, poets like to sound <laughs> fancy, so uh, I say Triolet. <laughs> I literally pronounced, uh, COVID as COVID the other day, um, and my friend was like, I love that, and I'm like, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we read too much and, and talk to people too little, I think, but that's just like... <laughs> That's how it goes I think for that's poets. With all writers. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks so much for calling in and sharing that, Jessica. It's always great to hear from you. Thanks, Tim. Have a great night. You too. All right, um, bye. Bye. Okay. So, um, so Richard, I hope uh, Richard Westheimer can uh, call in tomorrow because I got to put the kids to bed. Um, ah, he says he'll read the prompt poem to tomorrow. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, tomorrow I, I'll say one more time at um. An, an early time, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific time. We'll be on with Mark Allen DiMartino in his new book, Unburial. Uh, it's a poem all about his family history. Uh, he's an um, Italian-American poet living in Italy now, and he'll be calling us from Italy tomorrow at uh, 
3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. That's Tuesday, June 9th. So join us for that. And um, I just want to say thanks so much. This has been a great show. Um, I love Dorian and, and all the uh, feedback today. It was really fun. And I appreciate all you people out there. So thanks so much for watching and and uh, sharing your poems with us. Oh, before I go, yeah, I can't forget that. Um, the prompt for next week. Um, so tomorrow for, for uh, Mark Allen DiMartino's show, we're going to do the same prompt. And if you have any poems that you didn't get to share today, hopefully we'll have like different people in. Um, hopefully we can get Richard Westheimer to share his poem. Um, but the poem, the, the prompt for next week for the show, which I should have made it, but it's, uh, who is it? It's Sonny Greenfield. So for Sonny Greenfield's show next week, uh, here is the prompt. It is going to be, and ignore this, uh, ignore that part. It's not this week. It's next week's prompt. I put it in the wrong spot. Uh, it's write a poem based on your most recent dream. As we mentioned uh, from uh, Dorianne's first poem today that she read was from a dream. So uh, that's the weird coincidence of the day. Write a poem based on your most recent dream, but must not use adjectives or verbs. So we give you a little a little impetus, and then also a restriction uh, this week. So these are Megan's prompts. Uh, we'll have a, a poem, at least by Megan, hopefully by me too, next week. And um, that's your opportunity to uh, write a poem. So get started. That'll be next week, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern with Sonny Greenfield. That'll be a really excellent show. Uh, but before that, do come back for... Um, uh, Mark Allen DiMartino tomorrow, once again, at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. I'm trying to tell everybody because it's a weird time, and I want to make sure everybody knows so people actually show up live because it's so much more fun to have it live. Anyway, it's been a great show. Thanks, as always, and I will see you in uh, just a few hours, really. Take care. Have a good night.